Good day from beautiful St. Augustine, Florida. Serene, sun setting. Mm -hmm. We're not here for the daytime though. For after the sunset, we're heading to the St. Augustine Lighthouse for a little haunted shenanigans. It's nice and quiet where we are now, over by Fort Mentensis. I always say that. Mentensis. Butcher it. Um, but lots of nightlife downtown St. Augustine. We're not heading over into that area. We're heading over to St. Augustine Lighthouse, which is rich in history as well. Rich and steeped in haunted history. Uh, you normally cannot get into the grounds at the lighthouse, after except dark. for, yeah, after dark except for one specific tour that we're going to take tonight. So much serenity here. It's the calm before the storm. And we're back. Our destination, right there. So as we get ready for our tour to begin, which is the Dark of the Moon tour, I do want to point out that this lighthouse is celebrating 150 years in existence. It was built between 1871 and 1874. Of course, as we get ready to check in, you can see they have merch. Um, and if you want to join the shopping, make sure you do that. They are very sensitive. Would you guys like Jordan to clean out later for the night? All right, so we're all checked in. I'm waiting to go. And by the way, there's a lot of people waiting for this tour to kick off. This tour holds about 40 people. So we're all just congregating out here. So we didn't even get going yet. I brought my own EMF reader. You can rent one here too. But it's intermittently, look at that. It's, it's like dipping into yellow and red. That's crazy. And we're moving on. Lighthouse coming into view. And it is pitch dark out here. We're using low light mode on the DGA Osmo 3.
sure there's at least one of you in this group thinking, why is she telling me to go into the woods? <laughs> there are tree roots I might trip on. There are wild animals like raccoons. And that's how every horror movie starts. <laughs> yes to all of the above. But people also get a lot of activity in the woods. They hear footsteps following them in the woods. They hear giggling in the woods. So I definitely recommend going into the woods tonight. Just take the flashlight on your phone and use it so you miss those tree roots that are down there. We've split into two groups, heading into the keeper's house first. So dark. I go in the back here. My name is Aisha, Sammy introduced me earlier. I'm gonna be your tour guide tonight. This is Kane. Uh, Kane is currently shadowing and he is learning how to do the tour. So if you see a pale figure walking around, I promise Kane is up and living. <laughs> I do have a couple of notes before we start our tour. This closet that Kane is standing in front of uh, is a very spooky, very paranormal electrical closet. <laughs> so if you put any in that quiet, it will spike up. It's also going to spike up over on that table there. There's magnets in there, so if you put it down, it might spike. And it might spike over by these little tablets here. So if you think you're having a conversation with a ghost, it's probably a tablet from 2012. The Pit to Hell, this is also the entrance to the basement. So when you guys are exploring later on tonight, this is your entrance and your exit. I will not be tagging along for that. I hate this basement. <laughs> but let's start our tour. We're going to talk a little bit about the first lighthouse keeper to ever live in this house. Now we're currently standing on the main level of the keeper's house. The first ever person to live in this house was a Civil War veteran by the name of Reverend Major William Harn. And Major Harn was a very resilient man. Here at the lighthouse, we like to refer to him as the Forrest Gump of the Civil War, because if you can think of any battle during that time, he was probably in it. And during that battle, he did contract two illnesses, one being malaria and the other being tuberculosis. It was believed that the warmer climate of Florida would in some way aid his recovery. So he packed up his life and he moved down here to Florida to tend to the lighthouse. And he brought along with him his wife, Kate, and four of his daughters, with the fifth one being born later after they had already moved to the island. But upstairs was the bedrooms. Now the Harn family, lived in two small bedrooms on that side of the house. This means there was one man and six women all sharing two very small bedrooms with one outhouse. I literally couldn't imagine it and it's the worst part of the story by far. So with that, we're gonna move on. He actually passed away in the back corner of that upstairs bedroom that I mentioned and he passed away in his sleep. And we believe that he passed away of tuberculosis. We do believe this because even today, we will have guests that report hearing one of the main symptoms of tuberculosis upstairs. But we will have guests often that will go upstairs into the gallery and they will hear a loud hacking cough, almost as if it's right in their ear. And if you're on the main level or in the basement, it sounds like it's coming from right above you. We are heading upstairs. So dark. So far, not getting anything on EMF. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the construction of this current lighthouse. Now, one of my favorite questions that we get here at the lighthouse is why is the lighthouse so far away from the water? I thought it was to help the ships on the water. Great question, guys. <laughs> In reality, the original St. Augustine Lighthouse crumbled before this one was built. It's actually right across the street from us, over by that water and dock access. During low tide, you can actually see the foundation and what's left over. But when that lighthouse crumbled, in 1871, the construction for this current lighthouse was approved. And this would be overlooked by a man named Hezekiah Pitty. Hezekiah Pitty originally lived in Maine, so when this approval happened, he had packed up his whole life, and come down here, and he brought along with him four of his youngest children, three of which being girls, and the last one being a boy. Now, when you're a child, and you're in a new place, 
Obviously, there's a lot to explore, a lot to learn about. There's also a lot to play with. And for a construction site, this is like a giant playground. So he was okay with the kids playing. He wasn't okay with them playing on the construction site. That was his strict rule. Do not play on the construction site. These Victorian children were no different. To them, this was a massive playground. And one of their favorite toys on this playground was an old railway cart. You can imagine kind of like a mine cart on some train tracks. It connected the construction site here down to the water and they would get supplies back and forth. But to little Victorian era children, this is a roller coaster. They get in, they push off, they go flying down the tracks, and at the last minute they would pull on the brakes. They get out, they push it back up the hill, and they do it all over again. And they could do this all day if they wanted to. And there was one day, July 10th, they came out to this site, and they realized that the cart wasn't going to be in use that day, which means they could use it all day long. So they think, perfect. Now we can get in here, we can use it all day long, no one's gonna bother us, no one's gonna tell us no, no one's gonna tell us to stop. So they come out here, the three little girls, and they bring along with them one of their friends, whose name we unfortunately do not know. Uh, we do believe that she was the daughter of one of the construction site workers here, but we do not unfortunately know her name. They bring out this friend, they come out to the site, they pile into this little mine cart, they go flying down the tracks, what the hell? You okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> they go flying down the tracks, and at the last second, they go to pull on those brakes, and they realize why the cart wasn't in use that day. The brakes weren't working. So instead of hitting the brakes and stopping like they usually would have, they instead pulled on the brakes, did not go, they hit the end of the track, they flipped up into the air, and came down in the water with the cart pitting them down in there. Ooh. Now a man, a construction worker at the time, his name was Dan Sessions, witnessed this all happening, so he immediately ran out to the water hoping to save the little girls. He was a little bit too late. He was only able to save the youngest, Carrie, at four years old, and the other girls had drowned. Mm -hmm. They're usually the main attraction here. They are our pranksters. They are very playful, they're very active, and they are very friendly. And we're heading to the lighthouse. 219 steps up.
one night, it caught a very shadowy head and shoulders up on that fourth landing, just peering over, looking back down at where we are right now. Now, when the investigators saw this, they immediately ran out to the site and they started climbing the tower, hoping to catch someone or something, but there was absolutely nothing there. They made it to the top of the lighthouse and our completely locked observation deck was still completely locked, but the padlock was swinging back and forth. Now since then, we've had a lot of encounters and experiences with this shadowy figure, so much so that we just refer to him as our shadow man. Very often, these windows here will either open or close completely on their own, and this is no easy feat, trust me, when I have to do this, I have to fully hop up into the window ledge and unlatch stuff and close it back up again. It takes a lot of work, but sometimes these windows will just slam open on their own. We also get that front door that we just came through, closing and completely locking on its own. There was one point for about a period of a month, every single time we had a tour group in here, that door would close and would completely lock on its own. <laughs> All right, we headed into the garden. <laughs> I'm in my housekeeper, his name is Peter Vespusen. Now, Peter actually served 23 years right down to the day. He was a very dedicated, very resilient man. And he lived here on the site in this big old house with his loving wife, Lula. Now, during the time they lived here, they were actually very well known. They were very um, friendly and charitable and hospitable people, as the neighborhood would say, because they would throw these very massive parties. So, of course, people liked them. They would have these big lobster boils and dinner parties and all these kinds of extravaganzas. And so they were very well liked by the neighborhood. And really one of the only places that he could escape from the crowds of people on the site was here in the basement of the keeper's house. And he could smoke his very famous and favorite cherry tobacco. Now, Lula was not too much of a fan of him smoking in the house because that's where all the guests were. So she reserved him to only smoke in the basement of the keeper's house and at the top of the lighthouse. So if you could take a guess where today we still smell that cherry tobacco, it's in the basement and it's at the top of the lighthouse. Now, back in 1921, Lula would end up passing away. And this would kind of end a mark, this would kind of mark the end of the liveliness of this house. Now, Peter, despite being very grief stricken, still decided to stay at the lighthouse and still decided to work here. And he actually continued to work for another three years until 1924 when he finally retired. That makes 23 years, right down to the day. And when he eventually did move out of the keeper's house, he remarked that he could no longer live there because he could see Lula's face in every reflective surface of the home. And when you go down in the basement, it's kind of set up like this. There's the big spiral staircase, the pit to hell, as I mentioned before and it opens up into a big room. Then there's a long hallway that opens up to another big room. And in that big room is what we call Peter's room because in there are two wooden chairs, no historical significance. They are just two wooden chairs that Peter has seemed to take a liking to. And when you go sit in those chairs, you might get a little bit more experience from him. <laughs> All right, everybody is going in the lighthouse first. So we're gonna go in the keeper house and then go in the basement. We're going down. So it is pitch black down here. As I said, the basement had a hallway. Yeah. To go into the other room. The only light that you have is a glow light, so we're not picking up anything on the EMF reader either. There's two chairs that we heard stories about. I wonder what 
this one. So. Not oh, seeing that's, anything. That's kind of scary. Did you see this holes in those walls? No. Right there. No, go front. Right, right there. Oh, yeah. Is there anybody in there? <laughs> I just looked and I was like, oh, and I'm walking past. <laughs> anything down here? Ooh. We just had a spike. There was just probably whatever we're picking up here radio wise oh again one thing anybody here oh is this the creepy corner is there oh, anybody the in there corner. Ooh. wow what is in there is there anybody here can you hear us back up. All right, we're moving on around the corners here. I will say it's pitch black. Anything, anything, anybody. One little spike. Anybody in here? Hmm. All right, we're going to head upstairs. Zilch on the reader. A couple of things like right here. Is there anybody here? Anybody around here? We're going to head out this way momentarily by the other exhibits. Can't go in those buildings. <laughs> so, interestingly enough, there's a phenomena around street lights going out when certain individuals go past them. And it's something that I've lived with my whole life, uh, especially in New York City, at night walking by with lights going out. But what I noticed here, which is slightly chilling for me maybe, this light has been going out whenever we exit yeah, any of the buildings. Twice that I've seen. And the meter actually spiked a couple of times here too. So, let's see. Do you want to do anything for us here tonight? You want to turn back on? Want to give us a sign on? EMF? A little bit? <laughs> it's funny, when we came back out, it was it was just fading down. Yeah. It went out. <laughs> Anything at all. all right, let's walk over here. Maybe a little camera shy. The 
EMF is going up here. Anybody out here? Got like a chill down my spine. And here we go. Look at that. It went back on when it spiked. Take it for what it is. But I did just get a, a big <laughs> chill up my spine right when that happened. Is that you saying something to us? Hmm. That tree. And right. I just heard whispers over this way too. Oh, uh, you can hear it from that side. No, I heard something right over here. I guess we'll see oh, if yeah. the camera picked good. anything up. Anything happening over here? I can go off onto the trail. And supposedly, this is one of the more haunted areas. But it's also pitch black. <laughs> and now it's lit up with my shadow. Anything in here? Anybody? EMF dead. I feel like we're doing the speed tour here because we have 15 minutes to be able to get up the lighthouse. And it's a long way up. We're going back in. Okay. And they did put this little lantern on here, so you're not falling down all of the stairs. But earlier, we could clearly hear a whistle going on. See how far we get up. <laughs> this is a long walk up. Mary is not making it. Carry on. Almost to the top. This is a look down. Crazy. We made it to the top. So we made it to the top. I switched to the external mic because there's a lot of wind. And we are incredibly up here. Nothing on the EMF meter. You can see the beacon up above me. So the noise that we heard earlier coming from above was this window blowing open which theoretically shouldn't have blown open because it was closed and locked, but it did. Hey, Future Kyle kind of breaking in here as I'm editing the video. Just wanted to point out this window that ended up opening, which created that whistle noise, was shut and locked or shut to the point where it couldn't open on its own um, prior to us going into the lighthouse. That's the noise that we heard earlier in the, the clips when we were downstairs. Um, this is the same exact landing that Ghost Hunters had a similar experience with a different door opening um, and or the window and a REM pod. REM pods are essentially uh, devices that will go off if there's any type of movement nearby. 
uh, whether it's physical or ghost hunters or paranormal uh, investigators, use them to see if there's any type of uh, per perhaps like spirit activity in the area as well. So literally found in the ghost hunters that we saw after the fact, um, but we can share just a couple clips here with you. And uh, just again, the window opened. So maybe this wasn't such a bad investigation after all. That might be the one up there. It's blinking up there. We're gonna go back on this trail. Yeah. We'll see if we see anything, hear anything. I think a lot of this will let me know after we go home and look at footage, but so far, not seeing anything. No, very quiet. Nothing coming through here. You can go that way or this way. Continuing on in the woods. <laughs> Very uneven ground. But nothing on the EMF meter. Nothing. No. Not even a bleep. Huh? Alright, so not seeing anything except for the blinking light. Oh, there it goes, it just went off again, right behind me. All right, so, St. Augustine Lighthouse, we are wrapping up. Um, as far as the ghost tours go in St. Augustine, I thought this was a really fun one. I like this one. Yeah, compared to the old jailhouse and the wax museum and- Those are kind of hokey, uh, kind of, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the uh, Ripley's. Those are fun, don't get me wrong. You get to see some cool things. We've had some really interesting experiences there. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, as far as I know, unless I see something when I watch the footage back, didn't really see anything happening, no. and, uh, except for the light flickering. Um, and the window was explained up above, although kind of hokey explanation that the window was closed tight and then it just kind of opened and that was making the noise. But it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I will say when you come out here at night, it is really, really, really dark. So much dark that even after every time that they warn you to, they need to watch where, you, where you're walking, I fell down the stairs coming out of the, the house. Yikes. Oh my God. That shit hurt, dude. And I'm pretty sure like I may have fractured my hand. So um, there, there's that for sure. So that's probably the scariest thing here was the, mm -hmm. the, the fact that you can't see anything in front of you. Um, but the stories were good. This place is rich in history. Um, it was pretty cheap for a tourist type thing. It was 30 bucks a person. And they give you a little glow stick so yeah, that you can identify yourself that you're actually on the, on tour, the tour and not somebody that's breaking in at night. Because uh, apparently that's a thing. 
but we're going to get out of here. Thanks a lot for coming along. Thank you very much for all of your likes, comments, and subscriptions. Treat others the way you want to be treated. You had a good time? I had a great time. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.